Well, Johan, thank you so much for your time. Um, so we're excited to hear more about your book and of course, what we can do to preserve the night sky. Probably something that we haven't talked about too much lately. I think when you talk about pollution caused by human activity, light pollution isn't something we always come that comes to mind. You think of um, water pollution, land pollution, air pollution, but light pollution is definitely something that's maybe a little bit newer to us, thinking about what our impact is on the environment in regards to the amount of artificial light we use in our daily lives. Can you talk, so you have a very interesting background. Can you tell us a little bit about the research that you were involved in as a bat scientist and how that kind of led to um, writing the Darkness Manifesto? Uh, yeah, uh, I started out as a PhD student, uh, and at that time I studied bat vision. How do bats use their eyes? Uh, most people studying bats actually study echolocation. Uh, but, but they still do have eyes, and they're not blind, as, as the myth says. So I wanted to see how do they use their eyes. And uh, what I came up with after five years of studies is that they use their eyes a little bit more than we thought before, in short. Uh, but that eventually led me into, um, I don't work at the university as much anymore. I, I have a consultancy business. Um, and in the summers, I do different kind of surveys. And a few years ago, I was doing surveys at Swedish castles in, in southern Sweden. We were looking how many bats are there in, you know, in the vicinity of old castles. It was quite, quite a fine job. Uh, and we realized it was me and my, and my former supervisor, actually. He, he also became a consultant. Uh, so we were looking at these castles and uh, we saw that the vicinity and the gardens of the castle, they, they were pretty dark. And we compared that to the churchyards, uh, which were quite the opposite. They were very bright. All the churches had floodlights shining on the towers and on, on the buildings. We started to think, well, what's happening in there? Because we knew that in churches, there are always bats. Uh, my supervisor in, in the 80s, he started, how, where do the bats live? And he found that two thirds of all churches in Sweden have their own colony. Hmm. So, and he knew where to find them. So we thought, well, just let's do this again. So we, we counted the same churches and we found that today, 30 years later, there are only one third of the churches with a bat colony. So something had happened and it was all due to the light. Churches with floodlights, uh, in those churches, the bats were gone. And in the churches that were still dark, the bats were still around. And these bats can, they can be 30 years old. I mean, the record that you, that you know of a microbat is 42 years old. So in just one bat generation, half of the colonies were gone. And this was, this was just churches. So that led us to study more about the light. How, just out of curiosity, how do you count bats in it? Like how many are normally in a colony? Um, well, Swedish colonies are not that big. It's not like the Southern US colonies with millions okay. of bats. It's, uh, it's like 10 or 20 in-, in oh. Okay. This is a, this is a certain species. Like it's called uh, brown lunged bats, and normally they have around ten to twenty individuals in one colony. Okay. And either you can see them with your eyes in the attics, or you can stand outside the church counting them when they fly out. Hmm. Okay. When so. When did um, research kind of start on light pollution? When did scientists kind of begin looking at the effects of artificial light and how it's impacting our all species? Um, some things have been known for quite a long time. Uh, but insects are attracted to light, for example. That's one thing that has been known forever almost. 
uh, and also that birds are sometimes crashing into lighthouses, for example. And in the 19th century, there were London astronomers complaining about the gas lights on the streets because they thought the gas lights were too bright so they couldn't see the stars properly in London. Mm. Uh, but I, I would say it started as a research field like 20 years ago. Okay. In, on a small scale, but it really exploded about five, four, perhaps just three years ago. And today there are all kinds of scientists working on it from physiologists to microbiologists, ecologists, and astronomers, of course, and psychologists even. So it's, a, it's starting to get, becoming a really, really big field. Mm -hmm. in, in your book, you made a profound statement that artificial light isn't only one of mankind's most amazing <clears throat> amazing inventions, but it's also without a doubt detrimental to life itself. It can mislead 200 million years of instinct in an instant. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, when uh, I wrote that, I, I think it was in the chapter dealing with um, marine turtles. <clears throat> Uh, they lay their eggs on, on beaches. Uh, uh, they lay actually on, on the beaches where they once were born. So uh, they return to their home, home beach to lay their eggs. And uh, when the eggs are ready to hatch, the, the small baby turtles, they crawl up in the sand. And what they do to get as fast as possible down into the water, because it's, it's quite dangerous being a baby turtle. There are lots of predators around. So they need to get into the water instantly. So they just follow the light. They follow the brightest spot they can find. And that is uh, the horizon and the sun setting. Mm -hmm. But what researchers have found is that the turtles now are not going straight into the water, but instead they're turning around, uh, going the other direction into the cities because the hotel on the beaches, uh, street lights and city commercial screens and everything shining on the other side of the beach is brighter than the horizon. So the turtles go there instead. And this has been going on for 200 million years and lights have been around for 150 years. So mm -hmm. evolutionary wise, it's, it's this is very new and it's hard to for animals to, to keep up. Mm -hmm. So in the book, you talk a lot about circadian rhythms. Um, can you talk about what is it exactly and what species are affected by the circadian rhythms? Um, <clears throat> a circadian ry rhythm is, is a sort of um, a cycle in your body. Every cell has its own clock. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a bacteria or if you if you're a human, all cells in the world have, have this, this mechanism mm -hmm. uh, measuring time. So we humans, for example, we have um, a cycle going on for a little bit more than 24 hours. So if we would stay in a cave or something, no clues of light or anything from the outside, we would go to bed a little bit later every night and wake up a little bit later every morning just like teenagers, because you know, the clock is, yeah. And so we need the morning light to reset this clock. So every morning we tell the clock, well, it's time to restart the cycle. And then the clock starts ticking again. And all animals, of course, have different kinds of rhythms to, uh, so their behaviors are, uh, or their bodies function, uh, in a way that is appropriate with that specific time. For example, in the evening, we're supposed to go to sleep. So our metabolism is uh, slowing down, our body temperature is uh, low, low, and why? Um, So 
all rhythms are specific. If you keep your lights on at night, hmm. you seem to be having a little bit of a um, tell the body that it is. You seem to be having a little bit of a technology issue. Yeah, I, I got a message here that the internet is unstable. So, so I, I don't know how much are, are you able to hear us because you were kind of cutting out. Um, I, I'm hearing, but uh, okay. Yeah. I was just checking my internet symbol here, and that <laughs> looks perfectly fine. Okay. So we'll hope, move on. Hopefully, yeah, no other we, issues. We, yeah, we did have a storm coming in last night. Uh, so perhaps it's affecting the whole, I don't know, <laughs> the power went down for you know, 5,000 houses a bit oh, south wow. here, so, but, well, we managed. Uh, yeah, we were talking about circadian rhythms yes. and inner clocks and how we, how we function differently in different times of the day. Mm -hmm. And, and this is also something that it, it's not just a daytime cycle it's also a seasonally cycle so when it's time to migrate or feed or mate or anything uh, we need a sort of timer to tell us when do we need to do this and when do we need to do that and mm -hmm. and the things we have to tell us that time is it's temperature and it's light for three billion years, life has been around, and we had had life, uh, days followed by night and nights followed by day, mm -hmm. up till one hundred and fifty years ago. <laughs> Are nocturnal species like the ones most impacted by the the um, with the sky? like more artificial light in it are the the nocturnal species the ones that are like really impacted the most from this um probably at least it's the most obvious mm -hmm. because we take their whole uh niche away uh i mean bats there are 1400 species of bats and every single one of those species are uh, light active mm -hmm. Or, uh, and you have all these insects active at dusk or during the night. And if you start uh, pushing the day forward into the night, eating the night, so to speak, you mm -hmm. leave them with very little space. And if you shine a lot of bright lights, like, like all the lights from the city, uh, becomes this sky glow over this thing. and you, you can't see the stars anymore and if you're a night animal you probably uh, orient yourself using stars or the moon mm. and if you can't see the stars you really don't know where to go and there are a lot of animals also using the different phases of the moon to know what time of the year is or time of the month is and mm -hmm. uh, and then different kinds of breeding seasons, for example, will, will be very expanded. Instead of breed for three days when it's half moon, it's they can't really tell what, what phase it is. So the breeding takes perhaps three weeks instead. Wow. Um, in the in your book, you talked about um, in the chapter the measure of the night sky. You described the Bordel scale as a tool that they use to um, assess how much the night sky is affected by light pollution. How does that scale work and how do they how do they determine where where a city falls in that scale? Uh, yeah, it's um, border scale is um, it's based on visible objects in the sky, uh, stars or galaxies. Mm -hmm. and, and the more objects you see, the better the night sky. So if you have uh, a natural untouched sky, like if you're in a desert, in a remote mountain area or something like that, uh, you have a portal scale one sky. And then you can see perhaps 5,000 stars. Mm. But if you're in a bright city, 
downtown and you can count to perhaps five stars. That's a bottle scale nine sky. But almost, it's, it's not the worst cities, only like you know, Singapore, Tokyo, or New York, or any big city that has mm -hmm. uh, Sky 9, it's almost every city. Oh, wow. Uh, if you're downtown, and you, you need to really go out far in the rural areas. And I mean, mm -hmm. I live 10 kilometers from a really small town, mm -hmm. with 10,000 inhabitants, and that's 10 kilometers away. And I still have a sky with number four, I think. Hmm. So it's to reach that number one or two, that, that's, you need to go far away. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable. I mean, here we're up in Northeast Ohio. If you just travel a couple hours south to Southern Ohio, where it's more rural, it's amazing how many more stars you see in the nighttime where there isn't light pollution at all. And it's just remarkable to look up and see so many stars. It's just breathtaking, honestly. Yeah, um, I, 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 yeah I used to live in, in Gothenburg, the second city of Sweden. Okay. And I mean, I never saw any stars there. there there's an observatory in, in the city and they haven't seen the, um, the Milky Way since the nineties. Hmm. But since I moved here, I've been living here for a little bit more than a year now, and I can see the Milky Way almost every night. Oh, wow. I loved um, your reference to Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night in the book, um, which he painted in the late 1800s um, as one of the most famous depictions of the night sky. And it's kind of interesting to look at how that painting can be interpreted. Is it what he saw when he looked into the night sky, or is that a reflection of what was going on inside his head, because it was um, when he was at the asylum that he painted that. Um, I think he had some other references to other artists that do a lot of night sky paintings. And I thought that was kind of a, a nice reference to just in a, over 200 years, not that long, but just how different um, paintings have been interpreted over the years? Oh. Is it reflective of what the artist was seeing or is it reflective of what was going on inside the artist at that time? Yeah, that's the thing you always heard that Van Gogh was, well, a little bit insane. And, yeah. and that showed in his paintings, but still the skies were so much more at that mm -hmm. time. So. So I don't think it's so much far from, from the truth, actually. This guy's yeah. looked like that. Um, in the book, you talk a lot about the hormone melatonin um, and the circadian rhythm. What's the relationship between the two and how does artificial light kind of disrupt that cycle? Yeah, uh, melatonin is a hormone that is produced in the evenings. You, you need darkness for the hormone to, to be expressed. Um, and that makes the body come to rest. As I said before, uh, it has uh, to do with, for example, the uh, uh, relaxation of muscles and the body temperature and all sort of things. Because as a, as a hormone, it also affects other hormone systems. So it affects, for example, leptin, which is a hunger hormone. Mm. Uh, which suppresses hunger. We're not supposed to be hungry. We're not supposed to eat during the night. Probably a very old thing that we couldn't be out hunting every time, every, every night. Uh, so when we start messing up the circadian rhythm and, and we don't express the melatonin at the right point in the evenings, it's often too late. Uh, there is a connection between obesity, for example, it's a connection to diabetes. Uh, it's also connection to different diseases because of a suppressed immune system. There are some research connecting uh, hormone-induced cancers like breast cancer, prostate cancer, mm -hmm. uh, with living in too bright areas. Mm. But of course, when, when we talk about human diseases and it's it's so hard to keep everything apart and what's causing this and what's causing 
to that. But right. there is some statistics showing that there is a high risk if it's too bright and we suppress the melatonin. Hmm. There's some, uh, they started to notice that in shift workers to begin with. Oh, like so, those who work in the e like late later shifts? Yeah. And, and nowadays we kind of, we're living in um, a jet lagged society. I mean, you, you can feel that just traveling over the Atlantic or something. You, change the clock and it, it takes a while before you adjust and that is something that we do all the time today with you know, having two bright lights shining shining away the melatonin mm -hmm. so i know here in the united states a lot a lot of um, our light source our artificial light sources have come now to led lights and um, are there are there different artificial light sources that are more harmful than others? Um, yes, uh, depends on the context, but uh, generally, it's the white light is the light that you experience during the day. So when we get up in the morning and before lunch, we have a lot of white light from the sun which you know tells the body that well now it's time to reset the clock and doing like that but but when we get this light white light in the evening uh, it tells your body that it's still daytime so instead we should have a more yellow or amber or red light in the evening which mimics the sunset mm. that would be more friendly to our inner clock and there are some studies on red light also showing that insects are not attracted to red light in the same extent mm -hmm. as to white light. Mm -hmm. And bats seem to, to fly around in red light as well. So there is something going on there. We, we can adjust uh, the color temperature to, to have a little bit more, what you say, fauna friendly light. So I'm like, really, for people that are, you know, are our society today, many of us work on computers all day um, and we're on tech devices all day. And the amount of eye strain um, has probably drastically changed in just the last probably couple decades, um, just from people's use of being in front of these bright lights on screens. It's, yes, yeah, it's putting a lot of discussions about the screen light, the blue light, which is yeah. a huge part of the white light. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Um, what do you think would be the driving force to change our reliance on artificial light? What, what's going to make people want to turn off some of the lights and just enjoy the daylight more? Uh, well, one of those driving forces we 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 we're, we're, ha we're having already. Uh, with the energy crisis. Uh, when the lead light came, it was so cheap, we, we could put up, up so many lamps because it didn't cost us anything. But now we realize that, well, we need to cut every energy cost that we have. So, so money is, of course, one of the answers. Uh, but also, I think we need to, uh, because w once we turn one, lamp on and we see that the neighbors have, have two then we start thinking well it's pretty dark here we also need two lights we adjust all the time mm -hmm. so we need to try to go back a little bit i mean 20 30 years ago it was much darker but we don't remember that mm -hmm. so that is one thing but there are so many things you can do with just shielding off the light and switch them off when when you're not there using timers and motion sensors that we will we will not notice so just just being aware of that the light is actually harmful is, is one way i think darkness also just has a connotation of safety um you know like for example, like I always, I walk my dog in a very well lit place early in the morning because that makes me feel safer than just walking him in the dark. So how do we kind of get over that 
like yep. security yes. blanket of of darkness that or security of light in darkness how do we kind of get over that feeling of it's not lit i i can't see what i'm doing or i i'm afraid to walk by myself in the morning in the dark yeah that's a hard bit um uh, i mean we, we day creatures we we don't hear as well as many other animals we don't see as well in the dark and we're supposed to stay inside and you know, sleep when it's dark basically um but our society today is is made for it, it's a 24 7 world i mean we can do whatever we want at any time and we're very used to that and light is so connected to security that we can't see beyond that. But if you look at the studies, there, there aren't many studies showing that uh, crimes go down just because you turn more lights on. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's even the opposite. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's just a feeling of security. Mm -hmm. But So that is something that you need to work with. And it's very hard to get around that. But if you start turning off the lights, where there are no people hmm. when there are football fields shining through the whole night and nobody would play <laughs> football in two o'clock in, in the night right but just those easy things to start with mm -hmm. so there are um in the book you talked about uh it's the international dark sky association and they've taken a really proactive role in preserving the night sky in in different environments. The dark sky communities, are they all over the place or is it um, like, what do you know what kind of things that these communities that are considered a dark sky community, what steps they've taken towards preserving their night sky? Um, it's a little bit, it's different, uh, different places, but in general, it's, um, there are dark sky parks, which are smaller areas like nature reserves, but also with the component of darkness. Okay. So, uh, but there are also night sky communities. Then you have a whole, a bigger area where, um, where the municipality is involved in saying that, well, you can't have lights on after a certain time or, you need to shield off the light because the light is spreading. And there's a lot of astro tourism going on in, in those areas. And so the whole so society comes together to, to create a reserve for the darkness. And there are a lot of places in the US, and but it's also spreading around the world. So it's starting to get more common in Europe as well. It would probably be interesting to look at um satellite images of the earth over the last couple decades just to see how much light pollution has impacted what we're seeing from satellite. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, pictures like that on the internet and you can mm -hmm. you can follow uh, the evolution of lighting almost. I was doing a job for for city of Gothenburg you, a few months ago, just telling them how 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 can you can you change the attitude and how can you what can we do to preserve different areas and and I was looking at maps showing how much light uh, they have started to use just in the, the last ten years. And I was particularly looking at parks, and whereas in two thousand and twelve you can see green areas on the map, but in 2022, you couldn't. Wow. I mean, in, in just 20, in, in just 10 years, there are so many lights and it's such a slow movement, we, we, we don't realize. Yeah, I think um, in, in reading your book, one of the most fascinating chapters was on um, the coral reefs, your chapter on pale coral. Can you talk, I, I guess I, I've never actually seen in person a coral reef, but can you talk a little bit about what you talked about in the book with the pale coral? Uh, yeah, the coral reefs are like the rainforests of the ocean. 
mm-hmm. so many species. Um, and there have been a lot of discussions about corals the last decade about the warmer waters make the corals um, paler. Uh, mm. They're kind of bleaching out because the, the algae part of the coral is, is dying. So mm. the coral reefs are dying because of warm water. But there is another problem which hasn't been discussed as much is that they mate just once a year and they need to know where the moon is. So it's they just mate at a certain moon phase. And coral mating is just that they just release the what is called gametes mm. into the water. It, it looks like a, you know one of these snow uh, snow globes that you use for Christmas. You turn mm-hmm. them upside down and it's you know just snowing. It looks like that in the water. And for uh, for mating success, all the individuals in the same species need to do this at the same time. So that's that's why they keep track on the moon, because after full moon. At that time of the year, and now, now mm-hmm. let's go. Everybody does it at the same time. But if if you don't see the moon, they will just do this randomly. So the mating success is it gets lower and lower. Mm. And they, I mean, they had problems enough already. So it's it's a shame. Yeah. Well, um, we'll just. Well, happy to take any audience questions we might have. Just use the Q and A. Um, so you noted, I I know you talked a little bit about a couple of things that we can do, um, but you noted that light pollution is truly the easiest of the pollutions to tackle because it's something that we can take steps in our you know in everything that we do to make an impact on the amount of light pollution we have. Of course, I mean one benefit is lower electric bills. But what else can we do to preserve the night sky? Um, as you say, it's it's one of the easier problems to get rid of. We just turn off the lights. But at the same time, we won't do that because safety. Mm-hmm. We're too afraid to do that. And and we also need the lights a little bit. I mean, in traffic, for example. But there's, it's so easy. If you have a garden, for example, it's very easy to just turn off the light when you go inside. If you're not sitting in the garden, you don't need the light. That's very, very easy. And it's become also very trendy to have these lights shining in, in every direction. Yeah. You put the lights on the house and they're shining upwards and downwards. And, <laughs> and then you, you just waste the energy. You have the light shining up in the sky, which is not very useful for anything. It's just costly. Perhaps it looks good. Uh, but if, if you try to, to see the light as a more, more of a practical thing, thing that, you, that you use because you need to see things, then you have come quite far, I think. Mm-hmm. And you, have, you can have, you know, just very low light to, to see where you're walking. You can have timers so you don't forget to turn the lights off, motion sensors. Mm-hmm. And all these things are coming. I mean, with the LED, te- LED technique, they, it's the, the, the drawback is that it's too cheap, so we use them everywhere. But the benefit is that it comes also with a lot of uh, a, possibilities to adjust the color temperature, the intensity, uh, timing, so everything. So just use use the technology. So is, is this what you do then in your um, consultant consulting is that you go into organizations or businesses or whatever municipalities and you kind of look at what they're currently doing and what they could do to change? Yes, a little bit. And often I start with doing some kind of survey, what, what kind of I do the bat survey, and uh, I also let other people do some bird surveys and insect surveys, and mm-hmm. and then you know what animals are there. Do we need to protect them in certain ways, and can can we create some sort of uh, corridors, dark corridors for the animals? 
so we turn off just some lights mm -hmm. in some places so we can if we have two areas two parks for example we want we want to connect the parks and in um, in conservation you often talk about green corridors to connect parks but just by adding the darkness component to this you, uh, you also get the the night animals to to benefit from this yeah i think in your book you you, you made a comment that there's so many things that we acknowledge that they exist like the milky way the aura borealis but we just accept that we don't we won't see those things and that's kind of sad because if we did take some steps there are tremendous things that we could you know we could look at and see without just having to look at a book or look on the internet for what the milky way looks like some wow. of these things we could just see if we made some efforts in um our usage of artificial light. Yeah, it's only one fifth, I think, of Americans and Europeans can see the Milky Way. Wow. <laughs> well, so, we do have, I'm sorry, go ahead. We do have a lot of audience questions here. So we'll, we'll go ahead and take some audience questions. Um, Catherine asked, how are psychologists involved in light studies? And what kinds of things are they examining? Uh, there is one study, um, I think that they, they looked at how people react. If you have been under uh, a, re a true night sky for a while, compared to those who weren't, and it turned out you're a more relaxed and actually a nicer person if you have been under the stereo sky for a while. Uh, I don't know the details of this study, but it was a little bit interesting because I think the relaxing part can, has something to do with it. It's, uh, it releases stress somehow. So I, I think it will, uh, there will be more studies of that sort. But also there are some, for a while there have been, um, li living in, in the north, it, it's dark, large part of the year, and then you need some uh sometimes you need light therapy that's has been a thing for quite a while but there are some psychologists starting to look from the other side start using darkness therapy just because uh we're, we're so stressed out and we need to get rid of some uh there's so much information going on so they have sessions in the dark instead and try to talk to one another without seeing too much, without yeah. being disturbed of too bright light. And so that's also becoming a thing. So there's a lot of things going on there. Um, Mary asked that this is more about your, your research on bats. Can you elaborate how on um, elaborate on how bats use their eyes as opposed to their echolocation? Um, you can say that it, it's very different for, for different species, but uh, in general, they use their eyes for longer distance because the echolocation is very short range. Uh, they don't see very well, but they can see structures and they can see the horizon and where they're going and they can tell darkness from light and shadows, stuff like that. So, so they use it for orientation on a little bit for longer distance. Um, okay, Sherilyn asked, in your bat research, did you also observe a decrease in the populations of insects that the bats feed on? And to what extent were these correlated as much as differences in the castle gardens and the church floodlights? Um, I personally haven't looked at that, but uh, there are a lot of studies showing that insects are declining rapidly. And until recently, uh, light pollution wasn't really considered because there are so many other problems with insects, forestry and agriculture. And, mm. uh, but it's now light pollution is considered being a part of this. Of course, I mean, everybody has seen an insect flying around uh, 
a lamp, for example. And I know there are correlations between insect eating birds and insects. I haven't seen so many studies on bats correlated to that yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm sure that that's a huge part of the story. Eric, um, he asked, it seems that timers, motion sensors, and adjusting the light color can be very helpful to reduce the effect of night lighting. Are there guides available for municipalities to start making these changes? Uh, there are. Uh, uh, there are organizations like the, um, uh, now I lost the name, you, we talked about them just one minute ago. Um, <laughs> but if you, if you just Google light pollution and solutions, that they will come, there's a lot. Uh, and the whole field of light design uh, is changing. I, I've been talking to light designers quite a lot and I thought they would be the enemy almost being very angry with me for this book, but it was quite the opposite. They're very interested in this and they see this is the future. How, how do we design light for being, so we can use it, but we can, but it's more friendly to the surroundings. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's up and coming. So you can easily find that. Well, of course, in your book, the last, I think it's the last page of the book, you have the darkness manifesto and you have about 10, 10 steps that you can do to help preserve the nighttime. Um, so hopefully you'll pick up the book and read, <laughs> read what those things are. We have uh, one more question. Of course, any other questions are welcome to go ahead and put them in the Q and A. Um, one of our patrons said she once read once read a of a park on the edge of Lake Erie that has very low light. Do you know where it is? I don't. I don't oh. know how much you you know with um, Northeast Ohio since you're in a totally different part of the world than we are. But no, I, I've never been to Ohio, so um, <laughs> not yet anyway. So I I can't tell. But uh, I mean if. I, I've seen, for example, I, I, I was in Paris a couple of months ago, and they have parks that are pitch dark at night. Mm -hmm. uh, although Paris is considered being the city of lights, because people are not allowed in the parks. Mm. So, so they didn't need the lights. I mean, mm. I think it's a pity not allowing people in the parks at night, but it was a good thing they, they didn't have too much light on them. Yeah. Um, how detrimental is light pollution to plant growth? Uh, there are a few studies uh, saying that if you, uh, trees standing under street lights lose their leaves much later in the autumn because they, they don't realize that winter is coming. Mm -hmm. So they, they need to both the temperature change but also uh, the, the short days to know that this is a season where I should get rid of my leaves. Uh, and the opposite in the spring, the buds are earlier so sometimes it's beneficial for the trees but if, if there is a setback, if there is uh, freezing temperatures, then the trees are of course damaged. And I read just the other day that allergy ceasing is longer in light polluted areas. Mm, interesting. Perhaps that, that, that's not bad for the trees, but it's more bad for us, but it's, yeah. it's an effect you know, related to trees anyway. Interesting. Um, Kathy asked, how shall I attract bats to my urban home? They are already in the area. What else can you do to get them into your um closer to your you, home if you live in an urban area uh you you can have uh, night flowers like flowers uh, coming out at night to attract different night insects uh don't cut the lawn too much uh have some 
trees and bushes so they can you know, have some cover and a little bit of water is always a good thing and turn the lights off. Oh, okay, one of our um, patrons answered the question about the um, city that's close to Lake Erie. She said it is Dark Sky Park in Geauga County. Oh. For those of you interested. Um, there were, no, I was looking at um, the international, uh, the one that, that does the, I'm trying to remember the name of their, the International, International Dark Sky Association. Yeah. yeah. You find a lot of uh, information on their website. Yes, that's what I was just going to say. I was looking at their website and it's interesting just to see they list all the cities that are currently dark sky communities. Um, and there are quite a few in, I, I don't think I found one in Ohio, but they are, they're all over the US and Texas and even in New York. And um, it's just kind of interesting to take a look at their website and what their initiatives are, but kind of interesting. You said that some places are even putting um, like a, I don't want to say a curfew, but like a time at night that you have to have the lights down. Who enforces that? Um, like... Well, it, it needs to be implemented in, I mean, in the whole community and the municipality, everything. You know, they have to have people on board. But it would be a good thing if people started to do that by themselves, but you also need politicians who are a bit ahead of the time to, mm -hmm. to realize that this is something. I mean, it's, if you have, if it's a small town, it, it could be a tourist thing. Mm -hmm. Astro-tourism is a, is a growing business. Mm. So these dark sky communities and dark sky parks are uh, quite popular visits. Interesting. Um, Catherine, Catherine said, interesting research and discussion. What concerns you most about the future in relation to light pollution? Um, I think it's, uh, it came out as, as, there was a paper coming out a week ago saying that light pollution is increasing by 10% every year. And it takes quite a lot to turn that around. Mm -hmm. Although there are movements and there are increasing knowledge about this, we start to think about different using technology and turn this around. But we also need this change of attitude. So we don't, we should expect it to be bright as the day in the middle of the night, which we do. Mm -hmm. we, we trust the government to put the lights on for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. And we, we need to find the darkness again to, you know, to enjoy sitting out, look at stars. I mean, such an easy pleasure. Free entertainment. So yeah, so it, it, it's a bit worrying that it's still, the light proof is still growing that much. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit hopeful anyway, because, well, my book has been received much better than I thought. And mm -hmm. uh, and there are so many people actually interested in this. Yeah, um, and of course, one of our patrons said, thank you for bringing your, thank you for your work for bringing awareness to this important subject. It's definitely something that we um, haven't heard much about, but hopefully now that more people are aware of it, um, we'll, we'll start hearing more about what we can do in our communities, in our everyday lives to take a more proactive role in addressing light pollution. <clears throat> Do we have any other questions before we wrap up today? Okay, well, thank you everybody. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for um, taking the time to spend with us here at the Hudson Library this afternoon. And Johan Elkoff, thank you so much for your time on your Saturday evening um, in Sweden. The book is The Darkness Manifesto. Again, we have a link in the chat if you would like to purchase your copy from The Learned Owl. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for your research too. This has really been a, a very eye-opening book that I would highly recommend everybody reads. So. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon.
Well, thank you. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon, everybody.